we'll be talking about Song of Solomon. Uh, but before I did that, I wanted to mention uh, just some of the things that uh, I was so I was so proud of you, proud of you guys doing. Uh, Zach, uh, you you're always going to those going to the uh, trash cleanups and stuff. I mentioned it on, on Sunday night a couple weeks ago, but you weren't there. Uh, uh, about I don't think you've ever missed one of our trash cleanups. Um, you know, and 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 it, it's hard, in my opinion, to get out of you know. Just hiding in your house, for me. I don't know about for you, but for me it is. It does, it, for you too. Yes. But you have never missed one yet. I don't think. If you did, it was just one. Um, and you know, I, I was just, you know, so proud of you guys for doing that. You know, Diana getting back from work, going to it. Gracie, you're pregnant over there, wobbling around with the trash stuff. And, you know, Chuck, I mean, everybody's really pulling together to do these things. And it's, it's just really good. And it's doing something good in the community, too. And, you know, people do people do realize the stuff that you guys do. Um, and then also I wanted to kind of tie that into the fact that, you know, that's kind of our mission of, as a church, too. Um, our, our church has two things that it says all the time. We restore to build, restore people to God, and to build bridges in the community. And the things that you guys have been volunteering for all this stuff—that's building bridges in the community, like this Christian, like this Christmas box thing. This is really doing just—I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna be impacting 45 kids' lives. You know, so that's 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 a big thing that we, that you guys are doing. I don't want to downplay it. Um, so it makes you guys feel good, but also it's 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 good too. So you know, keep up, keep up those things, good I things. Got five boxes already. Oh, five boxes for us to pack into. Yeah. How, can you give us the dimensions real quick? Uh, it's a a fry, a fry box. About that big? Yeah, about you know. Can I come by and look at it? Like yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. to when do you work tomorrow? Uh, I work at ten to. Well, I work a double. Okay, so come in at. When when is the lunch rush get over? Uh, I go over there about ten o'clock and I open up the gate. Well, I can, you can drive through the alleyway or, or whatever. Okay, so I'll be there at about 10 then? Yeah. Okay, all right. And I, I'll, I'll just look at the box. Well, do you want me to take them now? Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, no, no. You can look at them. Okay, all right. See how see what kind of size we're dealing with. Yeah. Where do you and, get uh, these boxes from? From? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. And, and, and how, these were five boxes you got in one week? Uh, yeah, well, in like a couple of days. Okay, so it's possible that we could have 45 boxes by um, December? Yeah, yeah, it's possible. Okay. kind of, because we go through a lot of fries. Okay, good. I'll come by and look at it tomorrow. Okay, uh... Tell Randall to go and get more fries. <laughs> lots and lots yeah, of fries. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Nicole mentioned how she wanted to talk about Song of Solomon. Uh, so, uh... She was supposed to be here tonight. Uh, she will start. I guess she'll get her license this week or next week, so she'll be coming back pretty soon. But okay. um, uh, there's a few things with Song of Solomon. Um, some people have taught that it is talking about the love between um, Jesus and the church, or between God and Israel. People are trying to spiritualize. Yes, yeah. yeah, spiritualize it exactly. Um, and from this, from the outset, I just want to start with with this. No. It's not about any of those things. And we we know it's not about any of those things because it says it's not about any of those things. So, you know, let, let's not take the Bible out of context when it actually clarifies itself. So, um, let's get going on just the introduction. It was written uh, by either King Solomon or one of his, you know, court people maybe, or, or shortly after his reign, somewhere in that in that area. So we're looking at the, at the mid-900s. Um, Really, anywhere around like 950 or before or after, somewhere in there. Um, so just the, just the 900s, in the middle of the 900s. Um, B.C., obviously. Um, so this was before Israel split up into two kingdoms. This was before um, Assyria. This was before, well, before the, ri the, the rise of second Assyria and the rise of Babylon and Persia and all that stuff, way before that. Um, it was written as a poem. Um, as far as we can tell, its main idea is marital love. Uh, it, we can compare it to a lot of other um, love poems of, of the time. It's written the exact same format. Uh, there's actually a very well-known Egyptian uh, love poem that, that's very close to it. And it seems like Solomon got a lot of his, um, um, a lot of his uh, influence in his writing from Egyptian literature. Well, 
Yeah, Go ahead. Yeah. He did marry an Egyptian princess. He did marry an Egyptian princess. Yes. Which um, he wasn't supposed to do. In fact, uh, the book of Proverbs uh, relates to some of Egypt uh, Egyptian wisdom literature, too. Uh, very close there. Um, so there's just a lot of ties with Solomon's writings and Egyptian literature. Um, so for that reason, you know, it, it's very obvious that it is a, a, a poem about marital love. It is not about God. Um, it, I don't even, I'm pretty sure it doesn't even mention God in it. Um, I think it's one of the books in the Bible that don't mention God. Actually, it does, actually, at the very end, towards the very end, it does. Oh, well, we'll, we'll look at it as we get further through. Um, the main theme, um, obviously being love is good. It seems like it's quite possibly written to be more of a song to be sung at a at a marriage, maybe, or at a wedding, I mean. Um, that's a little bit up in the air, but I'll let you guys chew on that and come to your own conclusion. Um, it's either about the one that got away. If, if there, There's basically two big interpretations of Song of Solomon. The first one is that Solomon is not the man. And when it mentions when it mentions the king, it, 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 we'll, we'll look at this in the future, but the idea is more like, um, the woman in the song is the one that got away, and Solomon lost her, but the other guy got her. Um, a little bit less taught meaning. Uh, the other one seems more obvious, and, and at least in my opinion, and it's some it seems to be what most of the scholars and stuff go towards too, uh, that it was about Solomon's love with one of his wives. Um, so the th the obvious question to a modern reader becomes, well. That's kind of silly in light of how many wives he had. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll look at that idea more in the future, but it's not. Un it wouldn't be uncommon. Let me just say this: it wouldn't be uncommon for him to have, let's say, a favorite woman. Um, not a woman that was really his only true love. Like that's that's right. what I'm getting right. at. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes the first one is the, you know. The greatest love, and then everyone unless else's, Leah. unless it's Leah. Oh Poor Leah. Um, another important part of Song of Solomon, which is which is extremely important historically, is the idea that sex is enjoyable. Um, there's this, been this idea that has been going on in the church from the medieval ages that sex is kind of like this bad thing, um, and it actually built upon this Gnostic idea that that everything fleshly is evil and everything spiritual is good. Um, in fact, this is something that, that some people in the church even today still believe, that if it's of the flesh, it's evil, and if it's of the spirit, it's good, and it's just, that's just not true. But um, anyways, Especially in the Victorian ages, I think that's, that's when a lot of emphasis was put on the dirtiness and how bad it was. Right, right. And so with that being said, um, Song of Solomon was kind of just overlooked, and sex itself was just kind of tied as being evil. Uh, and so, with that being said, Song of Solomon's theme there actually kind of becomes important. It's okay for two married people to enjoy sex. You know, some have made it a thing of like it's a sin if you have joy, you know, with your spouse. And it's like this is this is not <laughs> not biblically warranted. And Song of Solomon clarifies that. Um, so whenever we get to this stage, people always come up with with the part. Okay, so if, so if Song of Solomon isn't validating God's love for me. Then how do I take it as a mar as an unmarried person? How does Song of Solomon have any value to me if I'm not married? Now we're going to look at this more throughout the coming weeks, but before we even look at that, I want to spend just a real brief time talking about where we find our worth from. First off, beauty is irrelevant. That that's kind of that's kind of a, a big theme right there. It doesn't really matter if you're the most attractive person in the world. Um, I mean, I've seen countless movie stars that were drop dead gorgeous in their 20s, and then they get to like their 40s and 50s, and it looks like a truck ran over them. You know. Besides that, even if you're the most gorgeous person in the world, what does that what does that really matter? You, you know. And so that brings me to another thing. Uh, being an extremely attractive person is actually a, a very strong temptation. And the reason why it's a very strong temptation is first off. If you're not the attractive person, the other person is, well, it's just more temptation for you to look at what's not yours. <laughs> yeah. And if you are the attractive person, then it's more temptation for you to think that you're better than someone else. Because I'm more attractive, or at least the majority of people think that I'm more attractive, that thereby makes me more attractive. And, by the way, people who are more attractive tend to have more insecurity about their attraction which just makes it more of a temptation for them to, you know, do things like become anorexic and those kinds of things. Right. 
So beauty has all kinds of problems that come with it. And then last, and I, but I think not least, is the idea that beauty is fading. Um, you know, we ha we as people have a very short prime, and then it starts going downhill quickly, and then our we start feeling bad. And you know, by by the time we we leave our twenties, most people feel like their youth is gone. I'm not saying I'm not saying anything about about looks i'm just saying most people who get out of their 20s say i feel like my youth is gone you know you start feeling things in the morning you start having more when you hit your 30s you start having more actual um physical things you have to deal with uh weight management those kinds of things when you're in your 20s you don't have to worry about that stuff but then as you start to edge your way towards the 30s you're like oh man yeah and and then you start getting up later maybe having a harder time going to sleep that kind of stuff stuff that you didn't have to worry about when you were a kid so you know let's keep in let's keep all things in, in in balance here. Just because you're single, does it doesn't mean that you are not attractive. And even if you are unattractive, it doesn't really matter because beauty is fading anyways. So let's just keep that in mind. Looks do not make you more or less valuable. You're not going to show up in heaven and God's going to say, "Man, I'm so happy that I made you more beautiful than everyone else." And uh, you, you know that <laughs> completely. <laughs> right? I mean, there are some things that we stake so much value on that just really aren't as important as we make it. Um, so anyways, um, if you are not happy with a relationship, you won't be happy in one. I can't get, get this out there enough. You have to find a place of accepting yourself before you ever get into, into a, a marriage relationship because it, you're, you're not going to find fulfillment in that marriage. Uh, here, and here's another way this applies. If you're in pornography before you get married, you'll still have a problem with it after you get married. I mean, it's, people think that once you get married, there's this golden thing that happens and all your problems go away. But it's like, no, it doesn't. Uh, now you just have to have to share this complicated life with another person who has got their own complicated life, right. and you've got these conflicting, uh, you know, goals and, and 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 dreams, and it's just like then there's you you got headbutting. But what there is is there's this this thing called the honeymoon phase. Now this is uh, when you first get married, everything's great, everything's hunky dory, and nothing can rock the boat. And uh, for some people, this lasts for years. For some people, it lasts for months. For some people, it lasts for mere hours. <laughs> it's really different for everybody. Um, but after this honeymoon phase is gone, you know, you're left with this real marriage. A lot of people nowadays, for instance, base their entire relationship on sex. Well, that's fine and everything, but what happens after sex? You're screwed if you don't like the person you're actually with. <laughs> See what I mean? People should stop asking so much about are they good with sex and start asking are they a good person do i really want to spend my life with this person just because i enjoy having sex with this person those are two different questions you know sex is really a secondary issue and i know everybody who's not married thinks oh sex but then you get married and you realize it's not as big of a deal as you thought it would be when you were single you know, like every every Christian kid says this: God, let me have sex one time before I before I before the rapture happens. L let me get married before the rapture happens. And then you know, the, when those things happen, you realize, oh, it, it really wasn't like this was such a big thing that I had to experience. You know what I mean? Like it's it just different than you thought it would be. Um, and some people live in a constant honeymoon phase. What I mean by that is they live going from entertainment to entertainment to entertainment. So once one thing kind of wears down, they switch to another thing, and in this way they kind of always give themselves a hype of life, which is very unhealthy because you never get to that, plain, that place of realism with your relationship where you can actually look each other in the face and see your ugly little flaws and accept each other and then work towards a common goal. Okay, so we all need intimacy, but that does not translate into sex. Everybody who's alive needs intimacy, needs people to connect with community. All right, but that doesn't translate into sex. You don't have to have sex to have a fulfilled life. And there's there's people who have sex with marriages. Or... <laughs> you mean marriage? <laughs> hey yo! <laughs> just kidding. I'm mean, just kidding. Um, uh, yeah. So sex is another thing that is not going to fulfill you as a person. Just get that out there. Um, and you know it's, it is also worth mentioning once again. I, I know I said I see this all this time, and I and you probably think I have a masturbation craze, but there's a lot of people who just guilt trip themselves into just not enjoying anything. Masturbation is not evil. Wait, what you say? Masturbation is not evil. It's okay if you're single to masturbate. Totally fine. Lust is the evil thing. Connected, but a lot of times that's connected with. The... But it doesn't have to be. 
Really? Yeah. You can masturbate without lusting after a woman, certainly, or a man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <you're right. laughs> Sorry, Isaiah, I know your background here, but no, I'm, I'm just kidding, I'm joking. Uh, anyways, uh, but with that being said, you know, the church has sometimes guilt tripped people to, I mean, just to the end of the rope where they feel like they're just such a evil person for having natural tendencies. The only thing that we need to tell people, warn people against is the lust part. That's the part that Jesus said, and there's actually no part. Here's something that amazes me. Masturbation was a very common practice, but the law never once mentions it at all. I find that amazing because of all the things that the law did talk about, it never once mentions it. And people knew about it. It was a very common thing. Everybody knew about it, just like nowadays. you know. But anyways, uh, good, good character is far better than looks. In fact, character is an invaluable trait, and it gets better with age. So that's, that's kind, of, kind of an important thing. The Bible always highlights character over looks. So just a few uh, things more, and we'll stop for the evening. In eternity, lo looks won't matter at all. It is temporary. It is. It is only a temporary problem. So if you think you're the world's ugliest person, hey, buckle down. It doesn't really matter. You only have to deal with it for you know a few years, and you're you're fine. <laughs> uh, right. It's it's really not going to matter then. <laughs> Um, and then, okay, so what, as far as what the Bible gives us a very good sense of where our worth comes from. First off, Genesis, the, the first thing that really absolutely essential to having any kind of self-worth. Um, as I've talked about in other uh, ancient literature, humans were kind of an afterthought of the gods. Um, they had no special worth. Uh, you know, the, the gods made them just to make their lives easier. They, you know, people were, were completely insignificant. Uh, the gods didn't think twice about wiping them out, all kinds of stuff like that. But in the Bible, it talks about how we are made in the image of God. This, this is what gives us value. Not our looks, the fact that we are made in the image of God. Male and female, we are both made in the image of God. That is where all human value comes from. And that's actually where, before God gave the law, he said in Genesis chapter 9, verse 27, he said, Do not murder because man is made in the image of God. That's the basis for why murdering a person is wrong. Because they are made in the image of God. Okay, um, then we get into the Psalms and the poetic books and and, and all that area there, and it, and it opens up another really important point. We are formed personally by God. Each of us was formed personally by God in the womb. So that means with all of our flaws, we are beautiful to Him just by being us. This isn't something that makeup fixes. This isn't something that perfect looks fixes. None of that gives us our value. Our value is from God who formed us in his womb, and he finds value in us. That's a lot different than you're going to hear on TV, but I think it's a lot more comforting than you hear on TV. So then we get to Proverbs and wisdom literature, and it talks about how good character is the main event here. Have you ever met somebody who's old and just mean? I mean just mean? Well, I grew up in the church, so I met a lot of them. <laughs> it seems like old church people are the meanest people in the world. I don't know why, uh, but man, oh man, they got opinions about everything. They want to nitpick you on everything. I mean, goodness sakes. Not all of them. Not all of them. But uh, man, oh man, I've met my fair, fair share. But how much better is it when you age well? I mean, that's just a good thing. Has, has anybody have had a nice grandma? One of those yes. older people in the church that genuinely cared about you? I mean that they, they were they were just fantastic, weren't they? You'd be upset about something and be seem like such a big deal, and they just kind of it's all right. When you're older, you'll understand this wasn't as big of a deal as you're making it. Just let it go. It's something wonderful about that kind of a character, and there's something wonderful about the you know the kind of um, uh, man who's not just looking to expose a woman for what she can offer him. There's something wonderful about a woman who's not concerned about just being the prettiest girl in the room, but some, but what has a wants to develop a genuine good character. You know, there's something good about that. And then First Timothy talks about um, about uh, men and women, and then it talks about married people too. But um, the specific part I want to talk about it says um, about women not adorning yourself. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, adorning yourself with good character rather than putting value in, in all these you know high-priced clothes or looks or trying to turn heads with your with your physical attributes and stuff I think that's kind of an important thing because I think all of us want to feel loved and sometimes we feel like the only way we can get love is if people um, appreciate us physically um, 
that's kind of gotten to be the trait for men too, not just before it seemed like it was more of a woman trait, but now it seems like it's a man and a woman trait. Yeah. So I, you know, kind of I think that different applies ways. to in different ways, but yeah, men want to be the strongest guy that everybody, yeah. all the and women tallest. to swoon. I've yeah. Always, I've always been kind of conscious about my height and everything. And then you realize that Ricky's shorter than you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm joking. Um, uh, but yeah, absolutely, it's it's something that affects I think all of us. Um, but uh, but anyways, that we're gonna stop there. We'll start ne next week with actually looking into Song of Solomon itself. But I think before you even look at Song of Solomon, you really have to come to terms with um, your value as a person and as a single person too. Um, and also with you know with that kind of stuff. So uh, we'll pick up on that next week, and I'll try to emphasize as we're going through Song of Solomon how it can apply to single people as well. Um, obviously, that's kind of a little bit limited with it being a marriage song and everything, but we'll still plow through. Uh -huh. um, any questions or comments before I stop? No. Yeah. Uh, this was one of the books that every time I read it, it was. I know it's it's wrong to say, but I was disgusted with it. <laughs> Seriously. Okay. And why do you feel like that? Because we used to have a pastor in our church. Well, in the church that I grew up in. And it seemed like every time he would preach, he would pick that book. And he would, like, mesmerize his wife. And I'm like, you know, we're not here to hear. Yeah. 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 So it's it, and like every time I read that, I think of that. I'm like, oh, man. so it made me disgusted to read that book now. You know, I have a very similar <laughs> situation, but with a different book. Every time Revelations would come up when I was a kid, it was a scare tactic thing. And I, you don't know how much sleep I lost as a kid because of the book of Revelations. <laughs> and I still have a hard time. I avoid it at all costs. So I completely understand having that view towards the book of the Bible. I completely understand. No judgment here. I get it. I get it. People have a way of when they're teaching you, if they teach you poorly, to make you disdain a book. Yeah. It is possible, guys. So it is real. This one my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've had oh, a hard boy. time with Hebrews because, I mean, as I've expressed to you before, there's some verses in there. They're kind of confusing, huh? Yeah. 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 You know, for the longest time, I thought Hebrews was the hardest to understand book. And now, I think it's the easiest to understand book. And I'm stuck instead on some of the other books that I'm like, what does this mean? <laughs> but anyways, okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll pick up there next week.